This week, the murder trial concluded into the deaths of John Kinsella and Paul Massey, with two men, Mark Fellows and Stephen Boyle, being jailed for life. I'm Neil Docking, the Liverpool Echo's Liverpool Crown Court reporter, and I'm, well, I'm delighted to be joined by our content editor, Gary Stewart. Hi, Neil. And by Detective Chief Inspector of Merseyside Police, Mark Baker. Hello, Neil. Good afternoon. It's been a fascinating trial to cover for me personally, working at the Liverpool Echo. Began back in November last year, concluded this week with guilty verdicts, which will see, as I say, the two men jail for life. You were the investigating officer. Can you tell us a little bit about your role in the case now you first came to be involved in these events? Yes. Um, good afternoon to you. Uh, Saturday the 5th of May 2018, only a matter of months ago really, Merseyside Police were contacted about 10 to 7 in the morning. The month of May was really, really hot, if you recall. Um, reports of a shooting, firearms discharge, just off Junction 7 of the M62 in Rainhill Stoops. Obviously our emergency services, uh, including the police and ambulance, attended and found John Kinsella dead on a pathway that ran parallel to the M62 slipway back towards Merseyside. A horrendous incident um, from a senior investigating officer point of view. Uh, really, really difficult. Mark Sivendale, a retired or retiring DCI, was actually the original investigating officer, senior officer. In fact, it was his last weekend working. Uh, he attended the scene. I picked it up that night. We had another murder that weekend, uh, mm. which gives you some indication of how busy we've we've been. Um, so John Kinsella, um, just a, a horrendous incident, really, from the start. Uh, you know, committed in front of his partner first thing in the morning. He was out walking his six dogs. Um, very few people around. Remember the first time I attended the scene, I just thought this is going to be a very difficult investigation. We were in the middle of a field. It was baking hot and um, didn't appear to be a great deal of CCTV. Didn't appear to be a great deal of witnesses. Wendy Owen, John's partner, gave us uh, an excellent interview from the start. She gave a very, very good description of the man responsible. What she told us, she said that we were out walking um, with the dogs, they were off the leads. She'd crossed from her home address across the roundabout, down towards the slip road, gone through what they call the piggy style locally. When she was approached by this lone gunman, in fact, she described that she thought he was gonna complain because the dogs were off the lead when suddenly she described what she heard, two puffs. Uh, obviously, they were two sh shots that were fired at John, um, which took him straight to the floor. One went, th we now know, went through his spinal cord and he was laid flat on the floor. Um, the gunman then turned, shot his gun twice at Wendy. Uh, she must have been absolutely petrified, uh, ran off. She climbed over the fencing, which took her straight into the slip road on the M62. Um, and the dogs ran off as well. As she turned, she saw the gunman stand at a close range and shoot twice into the back of John's head. Uh, that photograph is probably one of the most harrowing pictures I've ever seen as a senior investigating officer. And the investigation started from there. Uh, Wendy gave us a really, really good description of what the offender looked like. She described the clothing that he was wearing, uh, particularly the yellow high visibility jacket uh, and the black pants, cargo pants she described them as. Uh, and the black mountain bike. Now, from the start, we set a strategy in place around a CCTV trawl around the roundabout, looking to see which route the offender could have gone from. Uh, we quickly established that he travelled up Warrington Road, out towards St. Helens, back towards Warrington. We had footage of him coming and going, uh, and we believed that that was our offender quite quickly. We then set about uh, a really... Um, good strategy around chasing um, CCTV. Uh, in fact, it was that relentless pursuit of the evidence quickly that has been quite a significant factor in this case. Uh, we realised that uh, on Jubit's Lane, which is the first left turning on Warrington Road, there were what appeared to be a coming together between uh, a Renault Clio vehicle, the registration of which was come out in court, which was BTO6 HRC, and the gunman. And we knew full well at that stage that 
the two were linked. What we subsequently found out was that um, the registration number plate on the Renault Clio had been changed. Uh, the six had been converted to an eight with black insulation tape. We quickly spoke to Greater Manchester Police, uh, Carl Jones, Detective Chief Inspector, who led the Paul Massey investigation, and his deputy, Tom Kelly, came to visit me in Merseyside and gave us a briefing in relation to the circumstances around the Paul Massey murder. Was that because you knew that Paul Massey and John Kinsella were friends and therefore that these investigations may have been linked? No, not at that stage. Um, Greater Manchester Police were aware of the circumstances and felt there was a similarity between the two murders. They obviously knew that uh, they were, they were of their relationship because John Kinsella had attended Paul Massey's funeral. So they they were quicker onto it than probably we were in relation to that relationship. It's a good example of collaborative working between the two forces there. Well, and that's a key message really that um, we obviously would like to drive home that, you know, if you're involved in serious organised crime, collectively we will pursue dangerous people and um, bring them to justice. But you're right, uh, it, it did work fantastically well between Greater Manchester Police and Merseyside Police and also the Crown Prosecution Service as well. It, it was very, very good. Um, so just going back to the CCTV collection, really, it was that pursuit of the evidence around the route that was taken, we subsequently found out that Mark Fellows lived near to Junction 8 on the M62, uh, which is further up. And what we were able to do was track his route back from Rain Hill, Junction 7, back to his home address, uh, which was complicated because um, he turned through Sutton Manor Woodland, which was the old colliery, the old dream site on the M62, right through there and we deployed detectives on pedal cycles to recycle the route and through some good old-fashioned policing they were able to identify uh, CCTV from addresses where the, the offender had come out, Mark Fellows had cycled out. Because when he went into the woods he changed his clothing in an attempt to disguise himself, he changed out of all black clothing into the, the high-vis uh, jacket that you've described. Uh, and also his bike, uh, a mountain bike, had been disguised with voluminous yellow markings uh, covered by black tape. So it was important that you were able to establish that he owned a bike of that type. Um, again, I understand through sort of old fashioned policing of going into shops and, and finding receipts and finding CCTV footage of him buying a bike of that description, of him buying a bike helmet that matched the one worn by the killer. That's right. And that was a complicating feature around the investigation. What we saw on the day of the murder, on the 5th of May, uh, Mark cycled out, our fellow cycled out in uh, black clothing, as you've described. We had some good CCTV of him doing that and then we knew that he changed his appearance um, not far from his home address actually because of the way we traced him on CCTV into this high-vis jacket and he did that on a number of occasions as well he did it on the 29th uh, of April and a couple of days before on the 27th as well um, like you say good old-fashioned police work when Mark Fellows was arrested on the 30th of May we searched his home address in Warrington uh, so Cheshire Police have also helped during the course of this investigation. We've received fantastic support from them. We recovered a bike that he'd subsequently purchased uh, after the murder. We made some inquiries back at the bike shop where he'd purchased that bike. Sure enough, we identified the salesperson who said that he'd recognised him buying the GT mountain bike that he'd used during the murder. In fact, he'd actually asked him, where's the GT bike? And he replied, it's gone. And we now know the reason it had gone is because he didn't want the police to find it because it had been used during the commission of the murder. But like you've said previously, what complicated the investigation was he'd invested the time to actually tape up the mainstay frame of the bike to remove the high um, fluorescent painted colour of GT, which made it difficult to assess that was one of the same. And I would have to say that that was some fantastic detective work really to convince us and the Prime Prosecution Service, the senior officers from the start, that it was one of the same, that the um, Mark Fellows had changed his appearance. Because one of the complicating features around CCTV is sometimes when you look at the footage, you can blow it up and you can make somebody look bigger than they actually are. And that happened on this particular occasion. It was only when we went back and reviewed the CCTV footage and we looked at, um, we did a lot of work with the manufacturers of the bike and some real specialists in relation to actually, as you saw during the course of the trial, nailing on that it was one of the same bikes. Now, after the murder, 
Mark Fellows uh, developed a puncher. And it was then really that we knew that he was the gunman because he'd made that deliberate attempt to cycle back. I actually cycled the route myself uh, one day, <laughs> which was, um, it, it takes some doing. It's a long way from... Um, he was a very fit eight. man, wasn't he? He was a fit man. And we saw through the trial that he cycled 10K, uh, sorry, he ran the 10K in uh, in Greater Manchester 10K and the watch that he subsequently wore, the Garmin watch was worn during that race. Obviously we recovered that when he was arrested on the 30th of May and that piece of evidence proved crucial really to his conviction around the Paul Massey case because when we had it downloaded what we saw was that he'd conducted a reconnaissance mission he'd been out and ran the route uh, which assisted in the, the successful prosecution around him undoubtedly that was key evidence a real breakthrough moment during the course of the case yeah. a few months before the murder of Paul Massey he travelled on April 29th 2015 by bike and by foot to a field opposite Paul Massey's home and that's what the GPS watch revealed, that, that, that journey, and that he spent seven or eight minutes hanging around behind this church opposite where later the gunman would emerge with a submachine gun and, and, and kill Paul Massey as he returned home and stepped out of his car. Um, I think what was so fascinating about the CCTV evidence and, and the modern policing in this case is that a lot of this evidence was circumstantial evidence wasn't it there wasn't a, you didn't as you said you didn't have direct witnesses to say Mark Fellows was the gunman you didn't have the gun to hand there wasn't evidence in that respect but because of the hours upon hours I can only imagine hundreds of hours spent analysing all of the CCTV footage and also mobile phone cell site evidence and automatic number plate recognition technology Mark Fellows was almost he had no choice when it came to the trial but to admit that yes that was him in Rain Hill on the days in question um, and soon after, his accomplice, Stephen Boyle, was also forced to concede that it was him too in Rain Hill. And, and that's a result of the painstaking work that you'd put in, which meant they then had to give explanations for why they were there on all these dates leading up to the murder. I'm delighted that you said that. When we feel the same, that was the case. Um, we did spend hours and hours viewing CCTV. We collected nearly 400 items of CCTV from... Uh, various private addresses, including public places as well. Um, some people are reluctant to provide CCTV. Um, a serious organised crime investigation, particularly a well-planned murder like this, and it was, uh, is difficult to investigate. It was a very modern investigation. We saw through the course of the case, not just the CCTV, um, but we also saw use of encrypted mobile telephones, which, again, we, we had um, an officer from the Metro Metropolitan Police come up and talked to us and gave evidence about the implication for the use of the Aquarius phone, which criminals uh, used today. In fact, Stephen Boyle talked at great length when he was giving evidence about his use of the device and where you can purchase them from, and the fact that they're not available from the car phone warehouse or to ordinary members of the public. And this is a £3,000 telephone that stops people from being able to know what sort of communications you've been making to, to each other? There's an encrypted application on it, EncroChat, and um, obviously if we were communicating, it would be done in private, and obviously it's difficult for law enforcement at the moment to, to unpick that. Now, clearly, if it had been WhatsApp or messages or normal communication that people not involved in crime use, then it, it would have been much easier, and probably we would have been able to see the nature of the, the communication. You know, it, looking back on the trial, Stephen Boyle spoke about him being involved in crime through his life and in fact he said he was there to collect some money it was part of the drugs he was involved in drug dealing now if he'd given us the passwords to his phone then probably we could have interrogated his phone and substantiated what he told the police mm. um, but again he only chose to tell us that during the course of the trial when he was interviewed he didn't mention that earlier yeah, I mean, during the course of the trial, um, he obviously brought forward an account that nobody was expecting, least of all his uh, co-defendant fellows. Uh, he decided to tell the jury that he'd been duped by his longtime friend and, and criminal associate, who for many years he'd committed armed robberies with, who for many years um, he was someone he trusted highly. He suggested that fellows sprung on him the gun after the shooting that he thought he was going to collect his drugs money and at this meeting in Sutton Manor when the uh, the bike uh, pulled up alongside the Renault Clio that this handgun, this Webley revolver that was used to kill John Kinsella was passed through the window and that Mark Fellows had cycled away. He told the jury that he didn't want to have the gun in his car 
and he decided that he had to abandon the car and get a lift back home to Rochdale with family. He actually left the car in a street in Tasso Heath, where it was recovered by police um, some 10 days later, I believe. And that must have been a major breakthrough in the case because the car revealed uh, a number of things. There was a, a petrol canister inside. Um, the car, when it was discovered by police, was locked. And that, that revealed a big inconsistency in his account that he told to the jury because he told jurors that he telephoned uh, fellows after abandoning the car and told him that he'd left the car unlocked so he could collect the gun for him. Now, that couldn't possibly have been true because the only way the car could be locked is with the key or a fob. Um, that must have been a big moment for you when you recovered the car and it meant that you could then track him all the way back to his home and, and sight him on all these occasions travelling to Rain Hill. It was, yes. Yeah, it was on the 15th of May, so it was some day, 10 days later. It was in First Street in St Helens. We are absolutely delighted to recover the car. Um, and we did wonder from the start why it had been left where it had been. We always felt that Stephen Boyle's role was to collect the firearm. And like you've just said, during the trial, when he had made that admission, uh, that was quite an interesting moment. In fact, it was a real significant moment during the trial. In fact, if you recall, lots of members of the... Um, the public gallery gasped when he made that admission. So at that point, he'd grasped on his mate, um, you know, a lifelong friend. I think they've described as brothers in arms during the course of the trial. But going back to the car, the Renault Clio, that was really interesting for us when we recovered that. Clearly we did some forensic work around it. We were able to put Stephen Boyle to that car, which was important. Obviously from CCTV around his home address, we saw him. Uh, walking towards the car on the morning in question. He was wearing quite a distinctive scarf, you recall, which when we executed some warrants on a strike day on the 30th of May, we recovered the scarf that had been thrown um, at bins at the rear of the house. And you'd ask yourself, well, why did he dispose of that scarf? And we would say from an investigation point of view, the reason he's disposed of it is because it had been used potentially to transfer the firearm. Um, and that was real significant evidence. So he'd driven a distance of nearly 30 miles from Haywood in Manchester, and Mark Fellows had cycled a distance of eight miles, um, you know, at ridiculous times in the morning to get there for before seven o'clock. As you know before, as you said earlier, on the 29th of April, there was a, what we would describe as an aborted attempt. And the reason we say that is because we know that they got there just too late. Um, we saw from CCTV Wendy Owen and John Kinsell and the dogs walking back home and they'd missed their opportunity uh, to kill him that day. And we had a meeting on School Lane uh, immediately after. Now, we would say, from a prosecution point of view, that they were debriefing what had gone wrong. Uh, and that was a really interesting day for us, the 29th of April. And the reason we say that was because Mark Fellows was wearing quite a distinctive helmet. It was... Um, a helmet that was purchased from Holtz, Holford's. And again, going back to good old fashioned policing, we did some work around Holford's, a brand particular helmet they had purchased. And we found that he bought it on the 18th of April, only a few days before, and he paid £20 cash. And again, that was all captured on CCTV. And, and that was quite a significant moment, really, for the investigation. We then knew that it was him. Um, and obviously, we started planning then for the arrest phase, which is really important. I know we've talked about the, you know, the, the investigation team that have worked at the major crime unit, the new operational command centre in Speak, but this really was a one team approach to the investigation. You know, there's lots of support functions that have worked really hard, particularly around a modern investigation, as you've described before, you know, digital forensic unit, based there at the operational command centre, downloading phones, got CCTV units at headquarters. They were absolutely fantastic in gathering the footage that we needed. When you're chasing CCTV, it's difficult because you've only got a very short window of opportunity to get it because, as you know, a lot of CCTV systems overwrite it after a period of time. Of Sometimes it's up to seven days. So it was that relentless pursuit of the collection of the CCTV that was vital to us. So rather than come back when we collected CCTV... You know, the investigation was conducted out in St. Helens, Warrington, Rainhill, just chasing around the community and, and trying to negate that the gunman may well have gone somewhere else. You know, from an investigation point of view, it's not just about chasing the evidence. It's also about negating the fact that it could have been somebody else. 
And I think during the course of the trial, you saw that we traced a number of witnesses that were out walking dogs on the day in question. Uh, and in effect, what we did was rule out any possibility of the gunman being anybody other than Mark Fellows. And we worked really hard, really, to bring these witnesses to court. And it's hard bringing witnesses to court around serious organised crime because people are fearful. And I think from a detective point of view, we're really proud of the work we did in encouraging people to, to come and um, give their evidence. Yeah. When did you first centre on Mark Fellows as being, as being your prime suspect? When did his name first come into the investigation and how did that happen? It came when um, Greater Manchester Police came to see us. Um, Carl Jones uh, felt straight away there was strong similarities between the two investigations. You know, Paul Massey was a significant figure in Salford uh, and he knew that the gunman had waited for some time. We felt our gunman had waited for some time. We knew that from Wendy he'd cycled. Uh, Carl Jones told me that his gunman had waited for a long time and he'd either cycled or ran away. So we were looking for similarities between the two. We feel, uh, and I think the sentence reflects that, there's very few people that kill in the manner at which he mm. did. Um, so because of that, um, I had an open mind that it would be Mark Fellows, but I needed to see it from an evidential point of view. So although we were aware of him and we knew where he lived, we had to chase the evidence to support the, the, the case really against him. So although we had a working hypothesis, filling those gaps is... Uh, is, is what we set about doing and, and really strongly supported by Greater Manchester Police. Going back to talking about CCTV evidence, they have what they call a Vera unit, which again um, played out well in court. And they gathered a lot of the CCTV unit from around Greater Manchester, around Haywood, um, but assisted in pre presenting it in court because that's really, really important that we, we do that in the best format for a jury to understand. And as you saw, um, it, it came across well, and, and that was really important for us, really. I mean, the shooting of uh, John Kinsella's on, on May 5th, the arrest take place on uh, May 30th. Um, Fellows was arrested on board uh, a flight returning from Amsterdam at Manchester Airport. Um, Boyle was arrested two days later. Uh, he was hiding out in a hotel in Bolton under a false name. And obviously at the time you said you searched both of their houses. Uh, at what point between May 5th and um, and May 30th were you really confident that you'd got your men and that these were the people that you know, had committed this offence? I, I, I think probably quite quickly. Once we realised that the, the evidence was being gathered around the, the involvement of certainly Mark Fellows, and once we saw the links back to Stephen Boyle and the Cleo, and where he'd come from. We, we felt we was building a case. I think probably the crucial moment was when we saw that Mark Fellows had purchased the helmet on the 18th of April from Holford's, was, was a turning point. Um, you know, people said we were lucky around the evidence, and we would say that the harder we worked, the luckier we got, <laughs> because we, we, it was just that relentless pursuit of evidence, and we tried not to put off till tomorrow what we could do today. And when we seized opportunities, we saw other opportunities unfolding for us as well. Um, you know, the, the bike, obviously con contacting the, uh, the salesperson around that, that was a real significant moment for us. The recovery of the Garmin watch. Um, yeah, just hard work really. And, and, and looking at the detail around the CCTV, you can't underestimate how difficult that can be. The concentration required and what you're looking for. Um, you know, we saw through the course of the trial that Stephen Boyle actually attended on a motorbike on the 27th of April and met up with Mark Fellows then. In fact, John Kinsella walked past walking his dogs and we now know that that was another reconnaissance mission uh, and they were missing from CCTV for some time. Now, as you saw during the trial, that played out that they spent a long time planning where they were going to kill him. They spent two hours uh, near a motorway roundabout and um, Boyle told the jury that they were socialising, as the prosecutors pointed out, it's a strange place to socialise for two hours at a motorway roundabout when there's a pub nearby. And we actually saw on footage Boyle parking his stolen motorbike up by the pub, he said, and then spending some 20 minutes before returning to meet his friend. And in those 20 minutes, he was very close to the area of John Kinsella's home. And again, prosecutors were able to outline, well, this was you scoping out, scouting the area. I mean, they also, you, we've talked about a lot of the work that was done in, in, the, in the aftermath of, of the shooting in, in, the, in the days and weeks after, but even just in the immediate uh, time frame, 
the police response in the area, the number of sirens that would have been going off, the number of blue lights, the number of officers called to the scene, that may well have played a part in Boyle panicking and deciding to abandon the Renault Clio because that can't have been part of his original plan. No, we agree. And that is one of our theories that that's exactly what did happen. As he was fleeing the scene, he panicked. He had taken the gun with him. He knew he was in possession of the gun. And because police were making to the scene, um, he did panic and abandoned the car. And like you said earlier, we tried to say that he'd come back. He'd hidden the car underneath, uh, sorry, the, the gun underneath the driver's seat and then he'd been back and moved it. We don't believe that for a minute. The car was locked when we, we attended. In fact, we spent a long time searching for keys because that was the reason he didn't come back. And we would say the petrol can in the car was there because the, the intention was to clean themselves down and remove gunshot residue because they'd been involved in the murder and that was the purpose. So you're right, um, our initial response was a key factor in the recovery of some significant evidence further on. You know, there was people that attended that scene, including members of the public. It was horrific for them. And I think probably we lose sight sometimes during the course of the investigation, what they saw when they attended. Um, Wendy Owen herself, I have to say, paid tribute to her. I did immediately after the verdicts. She was absolutely fantastic and she showed real bravery during the course of the hearing to actually support us throughout um, and give evidence during the hearing. What you did see was immediately after we'd cleaned the scene, Wendy was desperate to go back and show us what happened. We videoed that with our two family liaison officers and that was powerful evidence really the way that was played out in court and she talked us through and that must have been a harrowing experience for her to relive that to retrace those footsteps uh, and we always felt that that was a, a really really difficult thing for her to do and for her to demonstrate that bravery and support in the investigation in the manner that she did was quite unbelievable really um, she, she is a credit to the family um, you know, John was one of nine he's got eight sisters met them all during the course of the trial and um I think our management of the two families was worked well as well. And obviously the results was really, really important for everybody concerned. This was a meticulous murder carried out by a meticulous man, um, planned to the nth degree using um, disguises. Was Fellows' recruitment of Boyle his downfall? Boyle seemed to panic, and go off the plan, and then, of course, later spectacularly betrayed him in court. Is that where he went wrong in, in recruiting his, this henchman? I think you're right. I think that was the case. I think he was let down. Um, ultimately, uh, whether he was let down or not by Stephen Boyle it, it is for the, for the jury to decide, I suppose, and the, as they did. But we still would have got to Mark Fellows uh, by investigation, regardless of what happened. Obviously, even before the recovery of the vehicle, we were in a good place around the investigation. And that was just the ice on the cake, really, that we, we got the car back. And when Boyle said what he said in court, which must have led to a, a few raised eyebrows, what was going through your mind? Were you thinking, this is it, we've got him? We were delighted, of course. I think everybody involved, or linked to the investigation was, including uh, the families, both families. Um, it was a significant moment. And we speak to staff that attend court day in, day out, they said that type of thing doesn't happen that regularly. Um, it's like something from off the TV, isn't it? It was, and, you know, I've been in the police 25 years, I've never seen anything like it, and I was uh, elated <laughs> as a senior investigating officer. We always believed that was what happened, actually, um, that he was handed the gun at that location. But for him actually to come out and tell us was a, a fantastic moment during the course of the trial. And we were really pleased and we felt then that Mark Fellows was going to have some difficulty um, with with the verdict after that. Yeah, indeed. He, I, th I think the evidence, um, some would say, was uh, many would say, and certainly the jury found, was overwhelming against Fellows even before that point. And in in reality, all that, did to, all that served to do was to implicate Boyle further in what had happened. A cutthroat defence, as, it, as it's known, a cutthroat defence when one defendant turns on the other. 
nine times out of 10 doesn't end up working out very well for either defendant. And I think so it proved um, because Boyle then found it very difficult to explain, as we've said, a number of points such as the car being left and it being locked or unlocked. He found it very difficult to explain why a partner in crime, a criminal associate of some 20 years, why he suddenly would have sprung a weapon on him when he simply could have asked him if he wanted to be involved in the enterprise. Um, I, I think it was, a, it was a moment that certainly in my 13 years of, of covering court, I've never seen anything quite like it. And it was certainly a pivotal moment in the trial. And the judge referred to it in his sentencing remarks, said that the account given by Boyle was a lie. The story about the Renault Clio being left unlocked for the gun to be collected was a lie. And, and I think ultimately it probably brought down both men. I agree. I do. I think um, it was just totally unbelievable, wasn't it? I think everybody in court felt the same. Um, really interesting moment. <laughs> it was. <laughs> and I may never see that again. <laughs> Indeed. One thing that um, experienced journalists and I think probably police officers rarely see, and which also seems like the stuff of a TV drama, is stirring a contract killer in the face. Mark Fellows was literally a contract killer. Have you ever come across someone like that before? Thankfully, not very often, and hopefully not too often again in the future. Um, you know, we, we've asked questions about this since. You know, what's it like to deal with that type of person? I think at the time you, you're too preoccupied gathering the evidence that you need. But certainly, the detectives that interviewed him said that he was cold. Um, and I, clearly that's the type of thing I'm interested in when we're debriefing the, the, the interview processes that are taking place. To do what he did is just unbelievable and uh, very few people, thankfully, will do that. And I think the sentencing clearly reflected that. The whole life tariff, you know, the first thing we did afterwards was Google it. Uh, and, and to see how many other people <laughs> have been mm. given them. And I think there's only 70 ever that have been uh, given that to the whole life tariff. And that gives you some indication of the level of planning that went in. Uh, it, it, you know, he, he'd committed murder before. Um, he'd committed a second one. And I suppose we were fearful if we didn't catch him, he may go on and do it again. And uh, we would say that was the reason he'd picked Stephen Boyle because... Mm. I know he wasn't found guilty of the Paul Massey murder, but we felt that he'd go to a trusted confidant, really, um, to assist him. But, no, really, really interesting moment. As you say, a whole life sentence, uh, as far as I'm aware, that's the first that's ever been handed down at Liverpool Crown Court. Um, they are extremely rare for the most, it's the most severe punishment that can be delivered by a judge for the most serious and exceptionally rare cases um, you talk of his, of his cold nature the court heard of a, a nickname that was ascribed to him the Iceman um, just hours before killing Paul Massey he was in a pub with his family enjoying a family meal with his ch one of his children playing with his encrypted PGP Blackberry phone on which he made the final arrangements for the killing after killing John Kinsella he returned home went out to the Trafford Centre and bought some shoes went out for a meal and then went celebrating, socialising with, with friends in pubs and clubs. Um, this was a man who was, it seems, entirely, entirely at ease with carrying out the most brutal assassinations and then going about his daily life as if nothing had ever happened. And I, I, as by his very nature as a contract killer, him being off the streets means that we're all safer, not just people involved in organised crime or people said to have connections to gangs, but to the innocents who can be caught up in these, the girlfriends, the partners, you know, the, the wives, family and friends, neighbours, uh, you know, gun, gunshots fired at houses we've heard about in this case, bullets passing through windows, through fences into neighbouring drives and into back gardens. We talked of the people who were caught up in the moment after the John Kinsella murder, uh, workmen who pulled up on the slip road, the motorway slip road to come to Wendy Owen's aid. All of these people experienced something on those days that, that will live with them forever. Um, and and now all of these communities are a little bit safer with these two men off the streets. Yes, we're absolutely delighted uh, the, with the sentence. It really sends a very, very positive message about tackling serious and organised crime. People don't like going to jail. They don't like going to jail forever. And I think that sends a clear message out and it will 
discourage others from getting involved, I believe, and talking to others in and around the court that may well be involved, I think felt the same. Yeah, so the um, the Iceman veneer seemed to crack when he got the whole life tariff. That perhaps surprised him how long, well, the rest of his life he was going to serve in prison. What was it like? I mean, you saw his reaction. Well, it was the first time he'd ever said anything during the proceedings. He stood up and he shouted abuse. He said that he'd never shot at Wendy Owen and she was a liar. Um, by inference, he was missing that he'd shot the others and killed them. Mm. Uh, and I think everybody in the courtroom believed that. And, you know, that was the first reaction we saw from him. We, we, we saw him shaking his head occasionally. I think he went bright red when Stephen Boyle was given evidence and he actually you know, disclosed that he'd handed him the gun. Uh, that was a really interesting moment, as we've discussed previously, but it caused some issues from a, a policing point of view. I think what people forget is, through the course of the trial, we've had a six-week trial. These have been based in, in Manchester prison, and there's a lot of police work and planning gone into actually transporting them between the prison and the court every day, causing significant disruption to the community uh, and some commuters travelling up and down the M62, Edge Lane. I know we've shut lanes and it's been a massive policing operation. And, and, and that was a really interesting moment from, from a, a security point of view, the fact that they'd been friends, lifelong friends up until that moment and what that relationship was going to be like when they went back to prison that night. They're unlikely to be sharing a cell now. I suggest not. <laughs> um. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you talk about the length of the trial there, um, you know, all those 26 days of, of the trial, 27 if you include the sentencing, the family, uh, the victims in the case of um, the immediate um, people affected by the incidents in the case of Wendy Owen and, and the, the family of both John Kinsella and Paul Massey, they sat through all that evidence, all that case. In the case of Massey's family, this is some three, nearly four years now since, since, they, since their loved one was killed. It must mean a lot to you having supported those families all the way through this journey and I imagine to have given them a lot of assurances and, and tried to try to tell them that, that everything is being done to, to bring to justice the people responsible. It must mean a lot to you at the end of all of that for them to be able to look you in the face outside court and say thank you. Undoubtedly, and I think probably that's where we take our pleasure from. But myself, uh, Carl Jones from Greater Manchester Fleet and Tom Kelly, uh, Kirsty Miller, uh, my deputy, um, Richie Jones. We, we, that's where we take our pleasure from. And um, the CPS as well, they worked really, really hard in pulling this case together. If you think back to the murder, particularly around John Kinsella, it was only on the 5th of May. We went to trial on the 26th of November. There's a lot of work involved in preparing a file. Um, I, 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 and that's what people don't see. Um, it, it's uh, the post-charge process is really, really complicated, and um, we worked hard, really, bringing that together in, in presenting the evidence in the manner in which we did. But like you said, supporting the family um, through the court process is really, really hard. It's such a drain on everybody involved. And what we didn't do was talk to the families about the evidence in great detail prior to the trial, because what we didn't want was any disclosure to be made to anybody involved. Uh, so a lot of the evidence was only heard for the first time. And I suppose from our point of view, my point of view, I know that frustrated the family that I didn't or couldn't talk to them about it earlier on because clearly there were two trials and what I didn't want was anything to, that I'd said have an influence on anything that might be taking place in Manchester and vice versa. The Greater Manchester Police were be careful about what they said to Paul Massey's family as well, um, only because that um, it's a very, very sensitive issue. And, uh, you know, we celebrated last night, as you'd imagine. <laughs> we were absolutely delighted. And I know the families, you know, when they're thanking us, and they both did, that they, it, it, you know, they've got to start rebuilding their lives now. And hopefully, as of today, they'll start doing that. Poor Wendy Owen, you know, she's the mother of a young child, been born recently. That child's going to grow up without a father. Um, she'll never get over it. I, 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 can, I can see that. 
uh, as will any of his sisters. How did you celebrate and, and who with? In style. <laughs> 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 we, we, we went for a drink collectively and, and members of the family joined us. Uh, and members of the prosecution team as well. That must be very gratifying for members of Paul Massey and John Kinsella's family. Paul Massey and John Kinsella, known members of the criminal underworld, their families, you could expect, would be distrustful of police, that they would be celebrating with you. Um, that is a rewarding factor of this case. And we spoke about that previously, that... Um, I think you've got to be careful, really, the way sometimes families are portrayed in the media. Um, certainly, I, I speak more specifically around John Kinsella's case because I'm the senior investigating officer for that. Uh, I know the sisters in particular, and Wendy, were quite upset at times by the way this, his name was portrayed in the media. Um, and they, they feel that we sit behind that. So... To answer your original question, I suppose, it, it was really, really satisfying um, from a family point of view that they felt that we've done our job in bringing two extremely dangerous men to justice. And we take great satisfaction from that. One of the things I, you know, I wanted to talk about today was the fact that it was the first murder investigation that we've led from our operational command centre in Speak, which was the new building we'd invested £50 million in from senior investigating officer point of view that was a key feature i felt of this investigation and the reason i say that is because i had all the key people i needed around me i had use of new technology which meant that when we were briefing uh, not just detectives search teams surveillance staff there was lots of work taking place they were all at my fingertips and i wasn't going in asking for people to assist me with um bits of requests, they all felt as though they were part of the investigation and, and working together and they understood the reasons why and you know, post-sentence I, I opened my phone up and I had nearly 300 text messages from <laughs> colleagues across the force who were involved in local policing, uh, response and resolution um, everybody you know, within Merseyside Police were absolutely delighted that we got the result that we felt we deserved, we'd earned um, you know I go back to the fifth of May. Sorry, the sixth of May, the day after the murder, and it was absolutely baking. And I went to see the crime scene officers at the scene, and it was so hot, and they were sweltering, you know, with the forensic white suits on, and the search teams were the same. <laughs> and we searched and searched and searched, looking for the gun, looking for the the bullets that we said that were discharged against Wendy Owen looking for all the evidence really and people don't always see that side of the um the, the investigation um and so, the other angles and the the other uh, aspects that perhaps you've already managed to discount that you managed to uh, you know you managed to put to one side by doing hard work you've managed to say well this you know this didn't happen we need to pursue a different uh, line of investigation that, that that sort of work isn't seen of course is it all the things that you've already ruled out no that's right you, you don't and that's really really important though because what we disproved was that through the cctv work that the gunman couldn't have come and gone from any of the other routes bear in mind we've got the m62 which meant the traffic up and down there as you can imagine it's really really busy even on an early on a saturday morning and even the link road back towards um uh, witness that link road there is incredibly busy we did a lot of work around ampr activity and i think 125 cars travel backwards and forwards up and down that road in the space of 10 minutes now to try and rule that out and the fact that the, that the, you know, the gunman had gone another route it's painstaking detective work really um to leave a jury with no option than to conclude that he must have been the person responsible you know, the timings were critical. That came out, didn't it, during the course of the trial? There was lots of disputes around timing. The calibration of CCTV is tricky. It, it, it is. Um, and sometimes the longer you leave it to go and collect it, the more difficult it can be to succinct the time back to real time and overlaying that with movement of phones. And this is a modern investigation, like you've alluded to before, really. We're talking about serious organised crime, and the, the investigations are complex. Yeah, the ideal scenario for a juror would be that you see the gunman with a gun in his hand and some witnesses would see it, but you know, he, John Kinsella was shot dead in the middle of the field, walking his dogs with only his partner to see that. Nobody else witnessed it. That is tricky. Paul Massey, 
you know, he come back from his uh, uh, holiday uh, away in North Wales. He gets out of his car and shot dead on his driveway again. Very few witnesses uh, saw what happened and the route that Mark Fellows took when he fled the scene, really, really difficult for the investigation, really. Uh, and he did an amazing job, Greater Manchester Police, in unpicking that, really. Well, he made it very difficult for you, but you uh, you got your man in the end. Well, many congratulations. Absolutely. All that painstaking work, it certainly reaped its rewards. It sounds like there's a lot of other people you owe a pint. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, thank you very much for joining us and, and giving us such insight on and what has been a you know a very troubling series of events, but a, but a fascinating case, and, and as I say, a great result for both Merseyside Police and Greater Manchester Police. Lovely. Thank you very much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you.